Good afternoon, everyone. This is Financial Literacy 101. I wanted to really have a discussion about other Black Wall Streets because I believe that it's imperative to know and to understand when and where you spend your money means an entire lot of what you support. I mean that wholeheartedly. Like, I really uh, go out my way in most aspects of looking for someone who represents my community, who supports my community. Because when we refer to Black Wall Street, we only refer to one particular place. And unfortunately, there, I mean, unfortunate, it was unfortunate that it was so, um, that it was so many that has been reluctant to have any shine, but also unfortunately that it should have been a lot more because we had in different parts of states a large population of black people that were supporting each other, but not in enough places where black people were. So we need to understand that, of course, you're going to spend your money with everybody. Okay. You're going to consume any product that you want to, but essentially what four goals is supporting your own because we are the most marginalized and disfranchised group. That's not a secret. Everybody, um, immigrants coming to America, uh, people who've been living here for you know um, years and, and decades, they already know that we're the most marginalized and disfranchised group. So whether it be Amazon Prime Day or Black Friday, billions of dollars are going to be spent, if not a trillion dollars are going to be spent by the black community. But the problem is we have the internet now and we're still not utilizing the internet to reach out to black vendors. Now, the most common thing that I've heard is, you know, why do products from black vendors cost more? That's because they're in a really, really small marketplace, okay? They have to move so much volume to make profit, okay? And profit is important, ladies and gentlemen. And what I don't like that I see a lot in the black community is that we always asking people for discounts. And we need to understand some services can be at a very decreased price while other products and services has to be at a price in order for people to receive a profit, to continue a service or to continue to create a product. We ask so much of ourselves that we won't do for ourselves. See, and that's why I believe that if you guys get in some sort of business, if you guys get in some sort of side hustle, then you will absolutely understand how much it, it is for the cost of business. But a lot of us don't understand business, so we are always looking for a discount or a handout. Most businesses don't give out discounts. They don't put stuff on clearance when they're not moving product, okay? When they're not making any money. The only time that happens is when what? Like Pier One, they went out of business, so they was like, oh, 20% off, 30% off, 40% off. And I've had people to approach me for um, financial coaching, say, hey, man, can I just give you 5 or $10 and you help me out? I like, no, I'm providing a service. I'm giving my time. I'm giving, you know, my knowledge and my education that I've assumed all the, all of the years that is worth something. And granted, when you compare me to other financial advisors, to other financial coaches, I'm very, very frugal. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, at a discounted price already. So it's kind of like, hey, I want you to take food out your mouth so you can put more food in my family's mouth. And we, we need to understand is, do we ask that of our non-black counterparts? When we go in, we buy products and we buy services. This is not how you can start any sort of black Wall Streets around the country. And now that we have the internet, we can reach out to other 
uh, uh, markets to other black Wall Streets that may be just online that sell products and actually give services. OK, and this is what I learned out from the civil rights era of our baby boomers. Right. That a lot of them don't believe that. And I don't know if it's a psychological thing or it's kind of embedded in their subconscious mind that people that look like them can actually teach them some things. That people like them can actually uh, uh, prescribe medicine and, and give them health advice and nutrition advice and investment advice and what they should do. Uh, like we, we seem as though that we have to go to non-black people for this advice. And I'm not saying that you can't do that. Don't get me wrong that other people don't have great ideas. I'm not saying that, but we tend to forego advice from people that look like you and I who might be at a higher intellectual level. I don't understand that. But other black Wall Streets, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you guys are familiar for that. I see we got Nolan Baptiste inside of the chat room. Nice to see you, sir. Code Red. What's up, fam? Ashley Hawkins, nice to see all you good people out here. Jermaine Anderson, I'm glad to see you all. And again, as I'm speaking here about the other black Wall Streets that a lot of people have forgotten about, there is a link in the chat. Oh, uh oh. Give me a second, guys. I am messing up over here. Okay, there we go. All right, there's a link in the chat that I want you guys to utilize if you have any questions or you want to comment. If you believe what I'm saying is wrong, please comment. I accept all comments, okay? As long as you're not being derogatory and, you know, name calling, all that good stuff, you know, very negative stuff. I don't allow that on my platform. But nonetheless, um, if you have, you know, anything insightful to say, any disagreement, that's fine. I accept it all. That is why the link is in the chat, okay? This is not a lecture. This is a conversation because I want you guys to understand this, okay? Give me one second. Give me one second here. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. I see that everybody can hear me. Let me move on. All right. Okay. So so let's go back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because that's the one that everybody absolutely knows. Let me just give you a brief breakdown. And a lot of my information is coming from the root to give them credit. But nonetheless, let's go back to 1921, June 1st. That is when... Uh, white um, looters, okay, and rioters and murderers burned the all black Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was an all black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Greenwood, okay, known as Black Wall Street. Now, they were angry at the economic success of blacks in that area, which is known as the first or one of the most prominent black Wall Streets because a number of successful businessmen and wealthy black people. OK, the white people from Tulsa, Oklahoma, accused a black man, accused a black man of raping a girl and they attacked the area. OK, uh, the citizens used dynamite. They they used planes to bomb the city, leaving more than eight thousand people homeless. And then the eyewitness um, accounts charged the vast majority of the people killed, estimated around 80 to 300 people dead because of the city law enforcement officers deputized. Listen to this because police brutality has been around for a very, very long time. OK, they deputized able bodied white men and handed out weapons from the city's armory. These were white supremacists. These were white domestic terrorists. These were race soldiers. OK, there is no official death toll, supposedly. Um, but most historians agree that the count was around 250 African-Americans who, who actually got killed because of the mass grave sites that they had to build. Now, that was the most notary, the most notable black Wall Street that most of us always talk about. But a lot of people believe a lot of people believe that was the only one. Now, do, is anyone familiar with the Haiti, the Haiti community in Dorm, North Carolina? Is anyone familiar with that one? OK, anyone familiar with the Haiti dorm, North Carolina, Black Wall Street? Because in the early decades of 1900, dorm, North Carolina acquired national reputation. They acquired national reputation because entrepreneurship businesses owned by African-Americans lined up Paris Street. Among them were 
North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Corporation. They're still around today. Okay, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance. Um, this was led by John Marrick, uh, Dr. Aaron Moore, and I believe CC Spalding. Okay, and then you have Mechanics and Farmers Bank, led by R&B Fitzgerald and W.G. Pearson. Okay, so now, granted, if you guys are looking for life insurance, I give out a lot of information dealing with that as well. But you can go to you know North Carolina uh, Mutual Life Insurance and get your life insurance if you want life insurance. And that is a black company, okay? Now, this is by W.E.B. Du Bois, what I'm about to say next. This is by W.E.B. Du Bois. He says, today there is a singular group in dorm where a black man may get up in the morning from a mattress made by a black man. Do you understand that? Like, that's so powerful already that the mattress you sleep on is actually made by somebody that looks like you. See, I think that we get so used to not associating race and color to products, but you should because when you do so, you understand who you're supporting. Like when I buy a mouse and I and I buy a, you know headphones, I understand that these are my Google Buzz and that this company um, it is ran a majority by white people, which is okay. They, they make good products, and I'm not saying you know that that is wrong particularly. But when you can pick up a product and say someone like me made this that gives you some sort of pride that gives you motivation to go out and do something great for yourself but as black people we're, we're so used of you know colonization in a sense of economics that we're just kind of this idly go by with everything and we don't get any positive representation of what we can do okay we're so much worried about what we can consume instead of what we can create. And I believe that we need to change the narrative and perspective of how we think about ourselves because we're so quick to show people what we have rather than what we can offer. You, you see what I'm saying? Hey man, you see this new Mercedes I just got? Well, go out and make your own Mercedes. Get a team of, of black engineers and black mechanics and go out and make something because that's what, that's what that one sentence is so powerful. And I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read the whole passage so you guys absolutely understand what I'm talking about. Today, there is a singular group in dorm where a black man may get up in the morning from a mattress made by a black man. In a house which a black man built out of lumber, which black men cut and plan. He may put on a suit. He may put on a suit which he bought at a colored, this is by W.E.B. Du Bois back in the day, at a um, suit shop and socks knit at a colored meal. He may cook food from a colored grocery store on a stove that a black man built. He may earn his living working for colored men, be sick in a colored hospital, and buried from a colored church, and the Negro Insurance Society will pay his widow enough to keep his children in school this is surely progress. Do you see what W.E.B. Du Bois covered in that one segment? He's talking about the bed in which you lay on is made somebody that looks like you. The house which is built is made by you because take, for instance, here in Texas. Majority of the people who are building houses are Hispanic people, uh, mostly from Mexico. So a lot of us when we see a Mexican building something, when we see a Mexican landscaping or hardscaping, we automatically associate that Mexicans, one, are hard workers. Two, Mexicans know how to build houses. But you don't put your own self-image in those shoes because first and foremost, unless you were, um, you were, were um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Man, I, the, my words leave me in that one particular moment. I apologize. But if you were uh, uh, gracious enough, that's not the word I want to use, but that's what I'm using for right now, to see someone who mirrors your image building a house, you have a different perspective, okay? Because when I went to the Dominican Republic, and these are, 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 are Black Hispanic people, okay? Black Latinos of African descent. When I see dark skinned brothers up and they building these large constructions, they're building resorts, they're building casinos, 
it gave me a sense of pride. I didn't care about their nationality. Let's let's just throw nationality out the window. Stop with the nationality. Oh, I'm an American. I'm a British this and I'm a, no, no. What are you truly? You have African descent. Boom, there it is, bottom line. So when I saw that, I was like, we can build houses too. See, until that moment, people like the only people who are building houses in America are the Amish, okay, and the Mexicans. But when you see somebody do it yourself, it's totally different. Now, he also says about black men building a stove. I'm leading up to all the black Wall Street, but we need to understand how this thing is broken down and deconstructed because it has to do a lot with your self-image. Because a lot of us, <clears throat> we would rather, excuse me, we would rather, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, we would rather go out and work for somebody than work for ourselves. We would rather spend our money with people who don't look like us. Because when I look at, um, us, take for instance, a rapper called Jonah Lucas, right? He was talking about how we as black people, he said it in his rap. I'm paraphrasing because he didn't say this exactly, but he said it in his rap about how we would rather go get Louis Vuitton, Fendi, Gucci, etc. But when a black man makes clothes, when a black man makes watches, we don't want to support them because the white society hasn't promoted it and advertised it as being of quality, as being of substance, of being expensive. That is our issue. If we really supported ourselves, we can make our things just as valuable as any other product on the market. Now, and again, I want to make sure that this is not taken out of context, that this is not about you stopping and shopping in, in white or uh, Asian markets. I'm just saying, what if you took an oath, you made a promise to yourself that you like every month, I'm going to at least spend $10 with someone on the black stock exchange, on the black markets, uh, black products in any sense. How stronger will we be? Let me move on. He also says that a black man can wake up and wear a tailored suit that was made by a black man. Now, a lot of us, when we think about suits, because again, entertainers, rappers, um, doesn't matter what color they were, we all idolize what? Italian made suits. Even myself, okay, I'm not contradicting myself, even myself. But if we can find a black person who is creating and making suits, are we supporting them? Are we telling them, oh, yours is not as good as a Tom Ford suit? Are we are we saying that? Because someone decided to make a suit out of the same material, just with a different name. You, you get what I'm talking about? What if it's kind of like my car, right? I like my car. Now, my car is not black made because I don't know any black people who are making cars. But nonetheless, some of you are like, oh, my car is American made. My car is made by Hyundai, essentially. OK, it's a Genesis. But take, for instance, Somebody's like, oh, no, I'm not going to mess with the Genesis because blah, blah. They come up, make us some rudimentary sort of excuse. But they would rather get a Mercedes or a BMW or an Audi or a Maserati. But what if my car has the same options, the same amenities, the same upgrades, the same wheels, the same leather? What if? What if? OK, because essentially they all are the same sort of car, different designs a little bit. But they both look good. LED light, same engine, same this. But because somebody stamped a name on it and they marketed it better and they advertised it better, then you think it's better. OK, and I've had my car five years, going to six years, and I've had zero problems from my car. This for an example. So the point I'm making is what if a black man had a suit company? And I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there. That I probably need to find him. And he made really great quality suits out of really great materials, but he put his name on it. Some of us will always say, oh, well, no, nah, that's not Tom Ford. That's not Gucci. That's not Fendi. That's not Coach. That's not this. I'm not going to do it. You, you, that's not Calvin Klein. I'm not going to wear it. I'm not going to smell it. Like, you get what I'm talking about? So there's a more sense of pride in that. Now, we're going back to Dorm, North Carolina, about their Black Wall Street. 
It says, shortly after the end of the Civil War, freedmen come to North, Durham, North Carolina to work in the tobacco warehouse, began living on the southern edge of the city. James E. Shepard, Aaron McDuffie Moore, John Merrick, and Charles Clinton, Spalding, some of the founding fathers of the growing neighborhood, named the area after Haiti, the first free independent black republic in the Western Hemisphere. Now, this is the second, this is the second Black Wall Street I'm referring to. Shepard Moore and Merrick went on to found the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Corporation, which became the richest black owned company during that time and today still has asset over $200 million, over $200 million. The men also started a land development company that built many of the homes and businesses in the area. Now, by the early 1900s, Haiti was the first black community to become fully self-sufficient. It built Lincoln Hospital, staffed by black doctors and black nurses, as well as a theater, a library, and hotels over two hundred businesses. North Carolina Central University was founded in Haiti in 1910 and became the first liberal arts HBCU to be state funded in 1925. Do you guys understand what I'm getting at? Now, I know for myself, and this has nothing to do um, um, with talent, education, but I feel more comfortable when I go to the doctor's office and my PA or my doctor is black. I do. I feel like they have my best interest at heart. I do. Because I went to a black doctor one time, right? And I say, hey, man, you know, um, I gained a lot of weight. Um, I got injured and I'm possibly, you know, on the verge of getting high blood pressure. He said, um, well, let me check your blood pressure. I was a little bit high. I think I was I don't want to make up a number. I think it was probably like 140. I don't know. I don't even recall. But the point I'm making here is he said, listen, I can prescribe you medicine, but that's not going to help you. It's going to pacify you. He said, what you need to do is you need to start eating clean. You need to start working out. And I was like, that's the first time I ever heard that, because quite frankly, he could have did like any other doctor would do is prescribe you medicine. And I'm not saying all black doctors are going to talk to you real. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in that particular moment, I was like, man, I really like having a black doctor. I, I really do. And it has nothing against white doctors, Asian doctors, Indian doctors. It has nothing to do with it. But I guarantee you, if you ask any person, okay, um, let's just do one through 10, because there's some people like, I mean, I don't care. I was like, good, great, um, good, great health care. But for a lot of black people and Indian people, people with a lot of uh, uh, community pride and, and racial pride, they say, you know, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I'd rather have a black doctor. I'd rather have an Indian doctor. I'd rather have an Asian doctor. Because we understand that in our community, we suffer from some of the same ailments. So we like to hear therapy. We like to hear medicine. We like to hear some sort of fix from people who look like us. Because guess what? They understand. They understand it better. You, you, you guys understand what I'm talking about. I'm preaching to the choir. I, I know I am. Let's talk about another Black Wall Street that um, didn't really get any notoriety, um, in, even in today. Jackson Ward, Richmond, Virginia. Jackson Ward, Richmond, Virginia. Now, in the shadow of Virginia's capital lies the Richmond neighborhood called Jackson Ward. This is in Richmond, Virginia. This is around 40 minutes of D.C. where I'm from, uh, 40, 45 minutes depending, okay? But before Black people moved to Oklahoma in masses, newly freed slaves, okay? Newly, I'm, I'm not going to even say that. Newly free Africans who were enslaved began occupying the area of the northern edge of Richmond's downtown district. OK, so many businesses emerged in the predominantly black community that it was called the birthplace of black capitalism. OK, it, it was called the birthplace of black capitalism because the area was home to so many black owned banks, insurance companies and other investment groups. It garnered another name that because of a tragedy would eventually become better known somewhere else. In the early part of the 20th century, Jackson Ward Businesses and Entertainment District was called the Harlem of the South. OK, the Harlem of the South, hosting names such as Ella Fitzgerald, Duke, El Duke Ellington and Richmond's own Bill Bojangles Robinson in 1910. 
In 1910, the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank opened in Jackson Ward. Its owner was Maggie L. Walker, the first black woman to, fa to found a bank in the U.S. A lot of black women didn't even know that. Okay. A lot of black people didn't know that, that the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank opened in Jackson Ward, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Okay. And the owner was Maggie L. Walker, first black woman to found a bank in the U.S. Now, much like Haiti, Jackson Ward decline began with all white city council plan for building and revitalizing the city, targeting, targeting Jackson Ward. And I'm going to tell you how they did this. This is how they sabotage our, our black Wall Streets and our black communities. A plan to build a federal housing further decimated the area after only 25 of the neighborhood displaced families were allowed to live in the 297 units that replaced the 200 homes that were torn down. The all white, the all white Virginia State Assembly completed dismantling of the historic area when it voted to run a section of Interstate 95 through the neighborhood in the 1950s. Um, history fact, ladies and gentlemen, what happened in 1956? What happened in 1956? Anyone in the chat? What happened in 1956? The Highway Act of 1956, where a lot through these black Wall Streets that a lot of you never heard of, they said, you know what? We're going to just build some federal buildings and we're going to put a highway right through this community. Why would you do that in the most prominent area in black communities where they are actually surviving on their own. They built communities surviving on their own. Like, no, 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 no. We don't want that. We want to keep these guys impoverished. We want to keep these guys separated. We want to keep these guys destitute. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a highway right smack through the middle of their entire community, of their entire community. So more traffic congestion, uh, you'll have more crime, You'll have um, people who don't even live in a neighborhood coming there. So many things happen because that Highway Act of 1956 is just too much to even go into. Okay, here's another Black Wall Street that you guys might not have known of. The 4th Avenue District, the 4th Avenue District in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, the 4th Avenue District of Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, during the heart of the Jim Crow era, the population of Birmingham, Alabama was much different from the city's current demographics. So back in the 1950s, most of the city, 37% black population, did their business in a downtown area of Fourth Avenue, known as the Black Business District. You know, <laughs> this really reminds me of what we don't have now. This really reminds me of what we don't have now. Does any now if, if any of you know this other than Atlanta? Uh, Atlanta, did I say Atlanta like Atlantis? Atlanta, <laughs> other than Atlanta, okay. Someone please in the chat, if you can, name an area where they call it the black business district or black town or African town. I know there's they're trying to make an African town up in Seattle, Washington, somewhere. Uh, or they're trying to do things in different areas. But if you notice, you have places around America where everywhere I've been, everywhere I've been, there is a Chinatown. When I was in Tacoma, Washington, they had a Korea town. Um, certain places in America, you have Little Italy. Um, certain places, um, especially here in Texas, I don't know what they call it. I don't know what you call it, but there is a lot of East Indian people that they have businesses all in this one segment up and down uh, 75, okay, up and down 75, um, where they have, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of shops, okay? A lot of them are food shops, uh, clothing shops, but nonetheless, is a, a bunch of East Indians, okay? From the um from you know Indian people from India. That's what I'm getting at. So you don't get them confused with West Indies, but East Indian people with a whole strip, like two streets on both sides of majority of Indian businesses. 
the point I'm making is that we don't have this anymore. We don't have this anymore. And it's not because all of a sudden black people don't want to make money. It's not because all of a sudden black people don't want to go into business for themselves. It's not because that black people want to support on other ethnic and other races for their wealth or for their means of supporting their family and themselves. That's not what it is. I hate to say this, but we all know the truth. We have been sabotaged. We have been sabotaged, but that should not stop us because slavery didn't stop us from being lucrative. A Jim Crow didn't stop us from surviving and being lucrative because even in those, in, even in those areas, we still have black millionaires. We, we, are a, we are a resilient race that regardless of white supremacy and racism and discrimination and disenfranchising, being marginalized and being sabotaged, being destitute, it does not matter. We have to figure out, continue not only to survive, but to strive and thrive in any economy, in any place on earth. It doesn't matter if you are in America, doesn't matter if you are in the in the UK, uh, no matter if you're in China or Russia or Australia or Canada or Africa or South America, does not matter where you are. As black people, we have always found a way to succeed. Now, getting off topic for one quick moment, stop waiting around for your stimulus check, harass the IRS, but get off your ass and do something with your time because your time can equal money. If you have a brain, okay, if you have a brain in your noggin, then you can go out and make some cash some way, somehow, legally. Let me move on, okay? Now, the area also known as Little Harlem, boasted retail shops, okay? Again, we're talking about the 4th Avenue District in Birmingham, Alabama, also known as Little Harlem, boasted retail shops, attorneys, doctor offices, a half dozen hotels, and much more. The buildings were designed by black, black architects and built by black construction companies, including the six-story built by the black-owned Penny Savings Bank. Because this city was racially segregated, okay, racially segregated, but home to a thriving iron and steel industry, Birmingham's middle-class sustained black-owned banks and insurance companies, by the end of segregation, 60% of the city's black owned businesses were in the black business district. Do you understand how powerful that is? We had our own banks, hospital, hotels, doctors, retail shops, attorneys. Do you understand that? See, when, when we talk about black Wall Street, we're not just talking about people making money. We're talking about a whole entire black economy, segregated separate from any other race, just us doing our thing. And, 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 and the reason why I love that uh, soon here, I'm going to take, uh, we're going to take a trip to Africa. The reason why that's important is because imagery, okay? The eyes to your soul, the, the portals to your soul is through your eyes. When you start to go in, you see, when I got off the, when I got off the ship, I was about to say, when I got off the boat, <laughs> when I got off the ship, I took, a, I took a cruise to the Bahamas. When I got off the ship and I started going to all these different establishments and businesses, and the only thing I saw was black people that looked like me, it gave me a sense of pride. It gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me motivation to say, why don't you go out and start your own damn business? You see what I'm saying? And in order to sometimes to see that, we need to see it in large quantities and large numbers. And see, that's why you guys need to go out and travel to a lot of these other black nations. OK, go visit Africa, go to the Caribbean and see people that that look like you and I actually have their own businesses. And here's another thing. When you also go travel, look to do business with them as well, because we're always looking to China, me included, where you can get products at a very discounted rate. Guess what? When you go to Africa. You know, you, you go to all these different companies in Africa, they they specialize in one product or another, and you can get it at a very discounted rate here and then sell it times 10 here in America and make a huge profit. And then you can start an organization and start hiring people. You, you get what I'm saying? So we don't have to always go to people who don't look like us to make money. 
I'm not saying don't shun business away either, okay? Because you can do, you can do business with a lot of people, but I'm saying you should not cut off your own. If that's basically what I'm trying to say. Now, the area was also home to Birmingham's famous civil rights struggles. Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church, notoriously, notoriously bombed by the KKK. That was in the middle of the black business district. The KKK bombed a Baptist church. That's nothing new for us, unfortunately. Now let's talk about Boule, Oklahoma. Because this always gets outshined by Tulsa, Oklahoma. Always, always. Now, before this is my last one, I'm gonna get off of here. I gotta run to the bike shop, go look at some bikes. Um, let me read some of your notes. Let's see what we have in here. I said, uh, what's going on, Miss Curly Girl? Nice to see you here moderating. I appreciate that. We got uh Jeanette Murphy, so true. Thank you, ma'am. And we got Wayne Peterson. Do you think a black Wall Street can be built here in America, or is it best to outside of America? Brother, let me tell you something, Wayne. Not only do I believe a Black Wall Street, as you said, you said a Black Wall Street, we can have Black Wall Streets and not in every major city, but also in every major town, we can have this. It doesn't take, well, let me, let me, let me not go too forward with this. Does it take a lot to build up? Yes, it does. But yes, it does. But we have the talent. We have the education. We have the intellect. We have the thrive. We have the strive. And believe it or not, we even have the money to do it. We have the money to do it. I'm going to tell you the problem. We are divided on so many fronts. We are divided on so many fronts. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, here's an example. I'm not a Christian. Oh my God. Oh, he's not a Christian. Let me get off of this podcast. Let me, oh my God. That's the first thing. I'm not a politician. I don't believe in a Democrat or Republican or independent. Oh my God, he's not a Democrat. Oh my God, he's not a Republican. Oh, he don't believe in politics. Oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself today. Lord Jesus. That is our problem. We are so darn emotional about every single thing. And as black people, not only have other people, okay, in the system of white supremacy, other people has given us this perspective that all of us may think alike. You see what I'm talking about? All of us have to be Democrats. All of us have to be Christian in order for us to like each other, in order for us to unite. No, 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 listen, your religion is your religion. Your political beliefs and what political party you subscribe to is for you. But how can we as a race, how can we as brothers and sisters unite so we can do better, so our families can do better, so our generations can do better? That is our issue. We believe that we need to agree on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, where in the end, the only thing that we need to agree on is probably one to two things. One to two things, maybe three, but no more than three, really. The problem is they divide us on one to two things. They divide us on one to two things. Well, if you ain't gonna vote, then I don't even know what you're talking about. What that got to do with us starting a business and making money for our families? What does it have to do of employing black people? See, here's the thing. Majority of white corporations hire majority of white people and they use as demographics, right? They say, well, the percentage of black people in America, okay, is around 13 to 14%. 13 to 14% of African Americans make up the black population in the US. Okay, cool. So if I'm in, let's say for instance, DC, um, well, no, no, I'm going to do more, something more controversial than that. I'm in Chicago, and let's just say, I don't know the numbers, I don't know the hard numbers, but let's say in Chicago, black people make up 15%. They make up 15% of the population. Out of that 
How many people are educated, meaning do they have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or they're certified in some sort of IT or licensed, okay? Then they say, okay, cool. We are a business that um, deal in um, coding software. Okay, so now out of that, we went from 15% to 3%, okay? I'm just, these are very arbitrary numbers, to 3%. And out of that 3%, how many out of that have coding software experience and some sort of certification? 0.5%. They say, well, we really only have to hire four black people out of a company of 5,000 people. We only have to hire four black people. And that's why you will see corporations like <laughs> they only have a couple of black people. They, oh, it's another because you have a bit like myself when I was working for Amazon and Amazon they employ a lot of people. But as a manager, as a manager, I was very, very, I guess, privileged to see two other black managers in my warehouse in my fulfillment um, facility. But slowly but surely, all the black people were either transferring out or quitting. I won't even go there with Amazon, okay? I won't even go there with Amazon. But nonetheless, the point I'm making here is this. When you do the demographics of things and you get into the percentage of things, they can quite frankly try to, you know, uh, kill the argument of qualified black people. Now, let's get into this. If we started multiple black Wall Streets around the nation, which I know that we can do this, which will start our own black economy where we are exchanging dollars to each other all around the nation. Then if a brother has experience, that would be his degree. If a sister has experience, that would be her license. Because then we will be on our own economy and we wouldn't have to worry about those things. We're talking about black entrepreneurs black nurses, black doctors, black hospitals, black banks. Then we won't have to worry about, let me go to Wells Fargo and get a loan so I can start this business. Let me go over here to Bank of America. No, no, no. We'll start looking into Freedman Banks. We'll start looking into black-owned banks like I did that one session. I did that one video on black-owned banks. And, and, and then you were looking for, uh, let's say, for insurance companies, life insurance. You'll start looking for North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance, which is black-owned. We will start looking for those things. So that is what we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen. It's not only possible, we can do it. It's not one of the things you just talk about. Immigrants come to this country. Immigrants come to this country like Chinese people. And in every major city, they have a Chinatown. They have a Chinatown. Almost in every major city, there's a Jewish town. There, there's a part of the city where it's Jewish. There's a part of the city where it's Chinese. There's a part of the city where it's Italian. And it doesn't matter the businesses they are in. They have their own businesses. And guess who they are hiring? They are hiring people that look like them. And anytime a black person talks black, then automatically this guy is a radical. This, this guy is a racist. No. I want you guys to open your damn eyes and see that everybody that you do business with hire people that look just like them. When I went to a pizza shop in New York, in Little Italy, in New York, everybody in the pizzeria that was working there were Italian. Were Italian Americans. When I went to Chinatown, when I went to this really nice Chinatown restaurant to get some good old Chinese food, everybody that worked in China, in that Chinese restaurant in Chinatown was Chinese. Then nobody ever say, why they don't got no black people working here? Why they don't got no white people working here? You in Chinatown, bruh. You in little Italy, bruh. So we make a black business district and we make a black Wall Street and people come to do business with us, we accept all money. I don't see, they don't care what color you are. They just color, they just care the, the color of the money. That's it. It's green, it's, it's American. Bring it on in here. So we can do this, family. And let me get on this last one. And I need to get out of here. Boule, Oklahoma, in the 19 in 1932, despite being warned by notorious blank robber charged pretty boy Floyd that the citizens of Boulay, Oklahoma were all armed 
and knew how to shoot. Two members of Floyd's gang attempted to rob the town's black-owned bank, okay? Because he wanted, I'm going to rob you guys. He said, well, come on, we all armed. The criminals ignored their bosses, went to the bank, and warned everyone not to set off the alarm. <laughs> and the customers doubtfully, um, doubtfully complied. They said, no, 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 don't warn nobody. Don't set off the alarms. We're just going to go to the banks. The citizens of Boule pulled out their guns and killed both bank robbers. Now, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd was white. These were two white robbers going into a, 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 a Boulay, Oklahoma, which is one of the Black Wall Streets, and talking about, we're going to rob you guys, okay? And <laughs> the criminals ignored their balls. They said uh, they went to the bank and, and warned everyone not to set off the alarm, and the customers complied. The citizens of Boulay put out their guns and killed both bank robbers. Boulay was founded in 1903 in the Creek Nation of Indian Territory. And if you guys don't know about the Creeks, they were Native Americans who were black. A lot of them were black. Okay. Creeks, Seminoles, and the Yas and the Yasmines. Yasmines. I always mess up their name. I apologize. But there was a three majority of Native American tribe that had a large population of black Native Americans within their tribe. Okay. Large population. Okay. So this, does, this makes a lot of sense. Boulay was founded in 1903 in the Creek Nation of Indian Territory, now known as Oklahoma, called the, the finest black town in the world by Booker T. Washington. So Boulay, Oklahoma was dubbed, was named by Booker T. Washington as the finest black town in the world. The city boasted more than 4,000 residents as its height, and the Afri African-American registry called it the wealthiest black town in the country according to the Washington Post. The town incorporated in the 1905 supported a newspaper, two colleges, its own water system, and a Black-owned electric plant. You see what I'm getting at, ladies and gentlemen? And as I'm strolling through all of this, we're talking about hospitals, banks, insurance company, lawyers, doctors, nurses. We're talking about retail shops. Now we're talking about water systems, electric plant. We all owned all of this. We owned it, we maintenance it, we fixed it. So growing up in Washington, D.C. was, some people may say it was eye-opening because you'll see a lot of black prominent people in D.C., but we all just had jobs. We all just had really good jobs. We didn't own anything. We didn't create anything really, not when I was growing up. And we sure didn't have no damn power plant. We didn't have no water plant. I didn't see an all black hospital except now the all black hospital was ran by white people and most of the doctors in there was white people was Southeast Community Hospital in Southeast DC. Southeast Community Hospital in Southeast DC. Yeah, a lot of the patrons there, a lot of the customers there because you paid a lot of money was black, okay? Oh man. Okay, a few years later, Boule boasted five grocery stores, five hotels, seven restaurants, all black. All black. You should have pride in that. Two insurance companies, two photographers, and an ice plant. Because it was the only black-owned town in the area, black people who could not shop, eat, or stay in hotels elsewhere traveled for miles to bank and do business in Boule. The population of Boule declined during the Great Depression and World War II, but the city still exists. Every year it holds one of the largest, most popular black rodeos after visiting Boule, Booker T. Washington wrote, Boule, like the other Negro towns that have sprung up in other parts of the country, represents a dawning race consciousness, a wholesome desire to do something to make sure race, to make sure the race is more respectable, something which shall demonstrate the right of the Negro, not merely as an individual, but as a race to have a worthy and permanent place in the civilization that the American people are creating. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the other Black Wall Street that you guys may not have been familiar with, but that you should have. This is very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, that you understand when people like Dr. Claude Anderson gets on and says something so radical like, Black people, now that we are integrated with everyone else, we're doing worse than everyone else. When we were set apart, when we were segregated, 
we made our own black Wall Streets. We had these black communities where you heard when when Lil Durrell messed up in school and everybody knew and he got his ass whooped by everybody <laughs> before his mom and dad got home. That no longer exists. OK, because we there is business. Uh, black pride, black power, black empowerment. Not only has this world, this world under the supervision of white supremacy has divided us as a people, but our self-esteem has been decreased by media, social media, uh, our own bootlicks, our own uh, uh, white supremacy supporters that look just like you and I have put a re-education of what we should do. Not creating jobs, but creating entrepreneurs. We, Wayne, to your point, a Black Wall Street is very, very possible. By having black Wall Streets around the nation that builds a black economy is even more feasible with the money that we have now. See, when someone speaks and they keep using a black, black this, black that, black this, some people get offended. I don't know why, but they do. But when you look around the nation and majority of the businesses, majority of the businesses are white, no one gets offended. And when you go to major cities, there's always a Chinatown where China uh, Chinese people have come here and created a Chinatown and they have a Chinese economy within the American economy. Nobody says nothing about that. And then you have Jewish communities. They made uh, Jewish Wall Streets around America and they're really, really rich. Nobody says nothing about them. Then in certain cities and towns in America, the Indians have went in and bought up a lot of houses. They bought up a lot of businesses and they built their own Indian a economy in America. Nobody says about that, but soon as black people get our shit together and we unite and try to build businesses and um, hire our own, people have issues with that. If that's not racism, I don't know what it is. If that's not hypocrisy, I don't know what it is. If that's not discrimination, I don't know what it is. Stop letting people tell you what is bad. How do you feel about what I talked about today? all the things that we used to have, even in the most racist times. See, we think right now, because maybe 50 black people get killed a year, and that's way too many by the police. That's way too many. But a lot of you probably thought it was a lot more than that, but by only about 50 black people a year, according to the statistics, get killed a year by police brutality and police murderers. But what they don't talk about is how many black businesses erected and hired black people. And there's always a naysayer like, oh, why, why I got to be black this and black that? Because every other race, every other group have their own. They have their own businesses. They have their own communities. When I go over right here in Texas, when I go over to... I think it's Frisco in Frisco in Frisco, uh, Texas. There is a there is a portion in in Frisco where majority of the population is Indian. It's all Indian. I, I, I'm telling you, the Indians in there, the Indians there are playing cricket in the parks. They're playing tennis in a tennis court. They're jogging. They're playing with their kids. The whole entire neighborhood are Indians, and they're living great. in those neighborhoods. They're, they're living actually great in those neighborhoods and that's what we're not understanding. That is what we're not understanding. So when we start to talk like that, it's a problem and I have no idea why. Why can't we have our own and every black person be okay with that? And every black person be okay with that. Why can't we have our own? I'm not even worried about white people. I'm not worried about Hispanic people. I'm not worried about Asian people. Why is it that we can't eat too? Why can't we get the bag too on our own dime? 
Why can't we do that? That is what is important, ladies and gentlemen. So I advise you to search, to look and find black businesses that not only supports them, but it will support our community as a whole. And kind of to give you a sense of pride, you can go to BOM. You can go to BOM. Let me look it up really quickly and I'm gonna get out of here. It's called Black Owned Market. I bought products um, from here before. I don't wanna see it on Instagram. I don't wanna see it on Instagram. Let me go over to their website very quickly. So you guys can see what I'm seeing as well. Okay. This is it. Black owned market where these, all of the vendors here. Okay. I don't want to do that. All of the vendors here are black. And they're selling all sorts of black owned products. If we can support and we do. If I'm looking at my table right here, right? Insignia, this brand for my TV. It's a Chinese maker company. If I'm looking at my mouse, I'm looking at my mic, I'm looking at my cell phone. All of these products are by white and Asians, mostly. Why can't we support our own? People that look just like you and I. People that look just like you and I. In order to have a Black Wall Street and to build other Black Wall Streets, we have to start by supporting the Black-owned businesses that we have right now, that we have right now. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys have a great and wonderful day. I will see you, I will see you this evening at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will see you this evening at 6 p.m. at Central Standard Time. I don't know why this blanked out. I have no idea. But nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, I am out. You guys have a great and wonderful afternoon.